like magic. It's just it's quiet. Or like immediately, this is a, this is incredible. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We are thrilled that you made it on this blistery cold evening to learn and to join us on the campus. So the Ohio State University Lima campus in conjunction with Rhodes State College is delighted to present the Eclipse Science Series to our community. So the Eclipse Science Series is brought to you through the generous support of Charles River Laboratories and it includes four speakers discussing different aspects of the total solar eclipse that will occur just in a few months on April 8th. Tonight's speaker is very special to our campus. Marie Walton graduated from the Ohio State University Lima campus in spring of 2023, just a few short months ago, with a degree in zoology uh, with research distinction and honors. She is embracing her dream career of being a naturalist in the education department of the Johnny Appleseed Metropolitan Park District here in Allen County. During her time at Ohio State Lima, Marie conducted research on how different species of butterflies and moths repopulate a prairie following a total prairie burn. She is continuing her scholarship, collaborating on an academic research paper with our own Dr. Robin Bagley. This evening, Marie will be discussing animal behavior during an eclipse. So I'm pleased to invite Marie to the stage. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super happy to be here. Um, like she said, I work for Johnny Appleseed Metro Parks. It's my dream job. I love working there because I get to teach people about nature and animals, which is what we are going to talk about today. We're going to learn about what animals do during a solar eclipse. But first, let's talk about what an eclipse is. So an eclipse is just uh, when in space there's three objects, and it's when one object in space passes into the shadow of another. So here on Earth, um, those objects are always going to be the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Um, it always includes one star, and here is the Sun, um, and then two other objects, which are the Earth and the Moon. Uh, there are two main types of eclipses, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. So a solar eclipse is where you have the sun and the earth, and then the moon goes in between and covers up the sun, which usually darkens the sky, causes some humidity changes and temperature drops. And then a lunar eclipse is when you have the sun and the moon, and the earth passes in between them, and the shadow of the earth is what makes the moon seem like it darkens. And an eclipse happens somewhere on Earth every 1.5 years, although the locations vary wildly and the visibility of it can be um, impacted by weather. So if it's cloudy out, it's a lot harder to see them, so it can seem a little longer than 1.5 years. We're all really excited because there's an upcoming total solar eclipse that will be visible right here in Allen County and the surrounding counties. So you see in this picture that I have of Ohio, um, in, between, in between the two red lines, um, and then the blue line is the center, is where we're going to be in the path of totality. So that is where we will be able to see the sun completely covered up by the moon, which is really exciting because the moon is actually 400 times smaller than the sun, and the only reason it's able to fit perfectly over it is just the power of perspective. So it's a lot closer to us, so it looks a lot bigger. It's going to happen on April 8th that we'll be able to see it um, from 3.08 to 3.19 p.m., which is actually pretty long for a total solar eclipse um, for the to totality of it. Totality is just when the sun is completely covered up and the sky gets really dark. So normally totality lasts from anywhere from... 10 seconds to seven minutes. So the fact that we get so long with the totality this time is really special. And we won't have another total solar eclipse for about 20 years. Uh, the next one will be in 2044. So this is a really big deal. Um, before I start talking about what other animals do during the eclipse, I think it's important to remember that humans are animals too, and we definitely react to eclipses. So here are some of the things that humans have been recorded doing um, in response to a total solar eclipse. 
So a long time ago in ancient China, in around 2100 BCE, there are records of warriors going outside and throwing spears at the sky and yelling because of a total solar eclipse. Um, the ancient Mayan cultures also reacted to eclipses very strongly. There's um, records of them yelling and banging drums in response to a total solar eclipse. In 585 BCE, there's a record from Greek historian Herodotus who said that there were two warring nations, the Lydians and the Medes, and they were fighting each other in a big battle. But then a solar eclipse happened, and both nations thought that their gods were angry with them, and they stopped the war, and peace was brought about between those two nations. So sometimes eclipses cause peace. People have been known to write songs about eclipses, and that's what this is a picture of up on the screen. It's a um, the cover of some sheet music that was written in the 1800s, and it's called the Total Eclipse Polka. If you're looking for an eclipse playlist, you can go on NASA's website, and they have a list of songs that you could play at your viewing party this year. You know Total Eclipse of the Heart is on there. Um, people have been known to have viewing parties. This is a picture from also the 1800s in France when there was a total solar eclipse, and people had gathered to view that in this public space. Um, people have been known to travel to see eclipses, as many people are expected to travel through Allen County this year to see the total solar eclipse. And people um, cheer and set off fireworks and honk horns when they see that moment of totality. People get very excited. And I think that it's really cool that today people kind of have the same reaction that they did 4,000 years ago in ancient China to throw things out of the sky. We throw fireworks, you know, and to make a loud noise. So I just think it's cool that people have always been, been people. So humans are animals that react to the eclipse. So it's reasonable to um, assume that maybe other animals notice and react to it as well. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence or stories of what animals might do during a total eclipse. Um, German scientist Christopher Clavis from the 1500s said that he witnessed a total solar eclipse and birds just fell out of the sky. Like they were flying and the sky got dark and they just fell right out. There are stories of bees returning to their hives, spiders taking down their webs and packing up for the day. Fish seeking shelter under lily pads, being maybe a little bit frightened when the sky gets dark. In general, a lot of the stories have some common themes, which are that there's an increase in activity by animals that typically come out at night. So animals like crickets, maybe you hear a cricket song during the day at that moment of totality, or owls hooting. And a decrease in activity by animals that are out in the day. So since it's dark, um, maybe birds start to fly back to their nests, or in general, daytime animals kind of um, just decreasing their activity. Birds that do different vocalizations throughout the day may start to perform their evening vocalizations during the eclipse. Some animals might uh, appear frightened, so a lot of stories of people's dogs or horses or even llamas appearing kind of frightened. Or some people said that animals do not respond at all. Well, eclipses are notoriously difficult to study because in science we like to change one thing and keep everything else the same. But eclipses make that really hard to do because they only occur every 1.5 years. And when they do occur, they're going to be visible at different parts of the Earth. So an eclipse that happens in South America is going to affect very different animals from an eclipse that happens in Asia. And they also occur at different times of day. So animals that are out maybe at 9.30 a.m. might be wildly different than animals that are out at 5.30 p.m., even if it occurred in the exact same location. It impacts many species. So if you were trying to observe um, all the animals that you could, if you were focusing on you know, birds and mammals that were around you, you might miss important things that insects were doing. I think it is important to remember that you are an animal also reacting to the eclipse. So it's hard for humans to really focus on what other animals are doing. The temptation is to, to look at the sky and see this event that you might only see once or twice in your lifetime if you're lucky. 
And then it's important to remember that other humans are going to be reacting to the eclipse as well. So all that cheering and shooting off of fireworks and honking, um, it's hard to tease apart if animals are reacting to the eclipse or are they reacting to humans reacting to the eclipse. Basically, each eclipse is short and impossible to replicate with accuracy, which makes it kind of hard when you're trying to study what animals actually do during the eclipse. But that doesn't stop people from trying to study it. We're curious animals, and we want to know if other animals um, experience eclipses similarly or differently than we do. And from this point on, we're going to take a look at some of the studies that have been done historically to try and figure this out. So in 1932, this man named William Morton Wheeler, he was a myrmecologist, which just means he studied ants. He was on the Eclipse Behavior Committee of the Boston Society of Natural History. And he started a campaign for a total solar eclipse that was occurring on August 31st of that year. And the path of totality was going to go over Maine and Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And so he got out the word through um, radio and newspaper to try and get people interested in collecting data on this um, subject. And so he recruited 100, participa 100 participants from 30 cities. And I just thought this was cool. This is a poster advertising the eclipse at that time from 1932. And it says, I'm just going to read it to you. Total eclipse of the sun. See nighttime when it's day in New England as you play. New England eclipses all as a vacation land. And then if you look, they have people doing eclipse activities back in 1932. So in the green square, they have a family using their eclipse glasses to look at the eclipse, which is just what, what people are going to do today. If you look across, across, you see two people kissing at the moment of totality, which is something we should bring back this year, maybe. If you look up to the right above the couple, it's a couple people traveling to see the eclipse, which is something people still do today. And if you look directly diagonal from that, we have an image that's a little hard to see. But it's a rooster crowing right at the moment of totality. So this is stuff that people have thought about for at least 100 years, wondering what animals are going to do and if they're going to respond. In 1932, they're thinking the same things that you're thinking today. Well, what they found with this study was that there was inform insufficient information. Wheeler even admitted that um, in the case of many birds and mammals and insects, that there wasn't enough information to go off of. And there's a couple reasons for this. So there were 100, per 100 participants, but in science, that's still a rather small uh, sample size. And also, those 100 people, they were not observing all the same animal. They were just observing whatever animals they noticed around them. So there wasn't like 100 observations on horses or 100 observations on bees. It was just kind of whatever they saw. So it was random. The typical behaviors of animals, especially like reptiles and amphibians, were not yet well known. So even today, you may think that you know what a frog does, but do you know what it's doing on a typical like Friday night versus what it might do during the eclipse? And a lot of these things weren't well known yet. And then the observations that were made by the participants were only at totality as well. So they didn't have anything to compare it to to see if they were reacting differently than usual. However, this was a notable study because it was the first recorded instance of using crowdsourced data on animal behavior during an eclipse. So instead of chasing eclipses all over the world, Wheeler thought that instead to gather a large body of data by having a bunch of participants in the area of the eclipse collect a bunch of different observations, which was really smart. And this is a really important study that we're going to come back to later on. Some other studies that have been done was there was an eclipse in 1999 in the UK, and they wanted to see if cows uh, responded to the eclipse. This one was really cool because they used software to um, analyze the behaviors of the cows, so you didn't have the human element of um, humans maybe being distracted by the eclipse. They watched them two days before, during, and after, two days after the eclipse, um, but they found no change in the cow's behavior. Which I thought was kind of interesting because I was looking at the 1932 study 
and there were 39 observations that people had made about their cows, and 29 of those did say that their cows reacted. So some people said that their cows turned to face the barn while it grazed, and some people said that their cows went back to the barn when it got dark. So I definitely think that 12 from this study that was done in 1999 is not a very large sample size, and more information is needed to see if cows um, really respond or not. There's another study done on the eclipse that was very recent here in North America on August 21st of uh, 2017. There was a total solar eclipse here in North America, and they looked at Western honeybees, and they were looking at the behavior of foraging and homing. So foraging is just when a bee leaves the hive to go look for pollen or nectar, and homing is when it comes back home. And so they observed the bees before, during, and after the eclipse, which is good. And what they found was as the sky starts to get dark, so as the moon is coming in front of the sun, the bees um, slow down their foraging and they start homing. They start to go back home to the hive. Once the sun com or once the moon completely covered up the sun, the bees stopped trying to get back home at all. They were just kind of stuck where they were. And then after the eclipse, they just kind of resumed doing what they were doing. And this is an interesting study because it can kind of tell us what kind of cues are bees using to make their decisions. So they might be using light levels, they might be using humidity or temperature changes to make decisions on when to forage and when to go home. There is another study done on the animals of the Riverbanks South Carolina Zoo. They looked at 17 vertebrate animals in this zoo. And they got teams of people to observe um, that were university experts, handlers who were familiar with the animal's behavior, and very qualified volunteers who were very active and worked with these animals a lot. All of them were trained in what the animals typically did, both as a species and like the individual animals that lived there, so the different um, differences between the individuals. And they also became familiar with animals' enclosures. There was a mixture of different types of sampling, so there was focal uh, sampling, which is where like this person is doing in the picture, she's looking at one individual and writing down what it does. So she would be like, at 5 o'clock it did this, and at 5.05 it did this, and going on and on for the amount of time that she's observing it. And they did this for uh, two days before, during, and two days following the eclipse. Oh, I think it's important to, notice, to note also that this eclipse only lasted, the one in 2017, only lasted for 2.5 minutes. So it's a lot shorter than the one we're about to experience this year. Um, they also used continuous sampling, which is usually used for big groups. And they only had to do this for two animals, the flamingos and the lorikeets, just because they were in a really big flock. So it would be really hard to look at an individual because it might get lost in the flock. So continuous sampling is where, in this study, it was every 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, they would assess, like, this many of them were preening, this many of them were looking for fish, this many of them were sleeping. And then they did that every 30 minutes. And they had shifts and did this for two days. The animals that they observed were Hamadryas baboons, Siamang gibbons, Western lowland gorillas, African elephants, grizzly bears, giraffes, harbor seals, California sea lions, American flamingos, lorikeets, cockatoos, lapwings, kookaburras, tiny frogmouths, Galapagos tortoises, and kimono dragons. The behaviors were grouped into four categories. So there was normal or baseline, which just means no change. They basically did not react to the eclipse at all. They just continued doing their day-to-day -day behaviors, such as resting, grooming, foraging, or playing. Their evening behaviors is when they initiated stuff that they're usually only seen doing in the evening, such as going near their shelter or maybe singing their evening repertoire of songs. There's apparent anxiety. So these are species-specific uh, signals that the animal is in distress such as group consolidation, maybe pacing, maybe their eyes are really wide and they look kind of scared, or maybe they're vocalizing more, making more noises than usual. And then the final one was novel behaviors, which is doing something new, such as a vocalization maybe that they never heard before, and um, as well as the animal looking up at the sky, showing that it acknowledged the eclipse. Oh, and it's important to note that in the, in the study they had, audio recording going the entire time. So the entire time that they were observing them, they had audio recording going so that if the animal did do a vocalization, they could analyze it later and see if it was different. So animals that just did their baseline behavior so they did not react at all were the California sea lions and the harbor seals. So usually these ones are pretty active in the zoo. They're playing, 
Um, they're swimming, they're interacting with each other, and they're interacting with the zoo's guests. And they just kept doing that. Maybe they're sleeping. They didn't really seem to react at all to the eclipse. Grizzly bears were another one that did not react at all. They are usually resting in the shade in their enclosures or manipulating their enrichment objects. And they just kept doing that, showing no signs that the eclipse was happening. And kookaburras, which are generally flying from perch to perch and doing their signature laughing vocalization. And they just did that. Some animals started initially initiating their evening behaviors. And these were African elephants, cockatoos, lapwings, and tawny frogmouths. So the African elephants, there were two in this zoo. And um, as the sky was getting dark, they decided to go back to their um, den. They have a little barn enclosure for them at the zoo. And one went inside that enclosure, and the other one kind of started foraging around the enclosure. So maybe getting a little, little night snack before bed. The Major Mitchell's cockatoos are normally more nocturnal. And so as the sky got dark, they initiated their evening behaviors by coming out of their boxes. The male touched beaks with the female. They started kind of raising and lowering their crests a little bit. And um, they preened each other, which are usually behaviors that they exhibit at night. The masked lapwings are usually pretty restful during the day. But while the eclipse was going on, it flew around. There are two tawny frog mouths in this picture. They are birds. And so there's a branch that looks like a, like a Y. And then the two fatter branches in between, those are tawny frog mouths. And they're doing a behavior known as stumping, where they kind of just look like a little stump on the tree. And their eyes are open just a little bit. And they're kind of passively scanning for predators. And if they see another bird or another tiny frog mouth like them, they might do a low vocalization, but they're not really doing a whole lot during the day. But while the eclipse was going on, they opened their eyes really, really wide, and they became super alert, just like they are at night. Some animals had um, started doing their anxiety behaviors, and these were American flamingos and hamadryas baboons. So the American flamingos are usually organized into two or three separate groups where they're foraging for food in the water or maybe they're preening or sleeping. But when the eclipse started happening, they formed a protective circle around the juvenile uh, flamingos, regardless of groups. So the several groups that are usually sectioned off came together to protect the juveniles. And then when the sun or when the moon totally covered up the sun, um, they started flapping their wings together. And then after the eclipse was over, they returned to their baseline behaviors. The hamadryas baboons are usually foraging or resting or grooming one another or doing displays of dominance and submission. Uh, but during the eclipse, and there's usually two troops of baboons at this particular zoo, during the eclipse, a similar response to the, as the flamingos, they uh, came together as one group, abandoning their separate groups, and started uh, swinging around the enclosure together and vocalizing as well. There was one individual baboon that was a little bit more upset by this than the other ones, and she paced alone for 25 minutes, which I thought was interesting. But after it was over, they resumed their normal activities. Some animals experience a mixture of evening behaviors and anxiety behaviors, such as the giraffe, gorilla, lorikeet, and kimono dragon. So the giraffes are typically grazing, but during the eclipse, they also did the group consolidation around the juveniles like we saw in the flamingos. And then they began running in unison in a circle, which is a prey or a predator avoidance a strategy that they do display in nature to confuse predators. Um, they pace and then they approach their barn enclosure. The Western Lowland Gorillas, most of them were packing it up for the day. They were going back to their little barn enclosure, but one, uh, the dominant male, became, became very aggressive. So that's why we say this was a mixture of evening and uh, anxiety. The lorikeets, this one was really interesting. So they all coordinated around their nest box while the eclipse was going on, and then they started having coordinated swooping, and then they would increase their vocalizations, and then they had group silence. And then they would do that over and over again. They'd increase their vocalizations and then just group silence, which is pretty interesting. The kimono dragon, these guys are usually pretty chill. They're usually basking, and that's what this one at this zoo does as well. They only had one. 
Um, so he was basking, but then as the eclipse started reaching totality, he got up to go into his little enclosure, but it was closed. And then when it was closed, he began running frantically around his enclosure until the eclipse was over, and then he just resumed resting. A couple of the animals did exhibit novel behaviors, and these are the Galapagos tortoise and the Siamang gibbons. So the Siamang gibbons are usually resting, grooming each other, or swinging around their enclosures. But when the sky darkened for the eclipse, they started swinging vigorously around the enclosure, and they initiated loud barking vocalizations that ended in like an undulating scream. And they analyzed that screaming sound, and it was a sound that they had not made before. And finally, the Galapagos tortoise. I thought this was really interesting because Galapagos tortoises are usually kind of more solitary animals, but there was a group of them that lives in the zoo. And as the eclipse uh, started approaching totality, the tortoises gathered together. When the sun was totally covered up by the moon, when totality was reached, they scattered away. And then as the moon was leaving the sun, they all looked up at the sky. Just really smart. There are, of course, some confounding factors. There were more people at the zoo than usual, so even though they were doing this observational study, they were still allowing people at the zoo. Um, it was a really hot day, and the people were very excited about the eclipse, as people are wont to do. As the eclipse was happening, so as it reached totality, there were fireworks being set off and cheering, and a helicopter flew overhead. So were the animals responding to the eclipse, or were they reacting to humans reacting to the eclipse? It's hard to say. And then, of course, these were not wild animals. These are animals that are in captivity, so maybe some of the behaviors were learned. It's hard to say if they uh, would react differently from their wild counterparts. However, the findings in this study of the behaviors of these animals does echo uh, other literature. So this is a pretty good one to go off of, that these animals are reacting the way that other members of their species have reacted before to eclipses. So it's a good summary. There was another project in 2017 for that eclipse that occurred here whoops, in North America. Um, and it was hosted on the iNaturalist platform. And iNaturalist is an app or a website where you can upload a picture from anywhere in the world to record uh, biodiversity that is encountered. And this was a project that was started where people could submit their observations. So the map picture that I have here with the little orange dots, um, the little orange dots are places where people submitted their data from for this project. And then the two lines that you see going through North America are the, the path of totality. So that's where people could see the total eclipse here in North America. There were written instructions for this project that people could follow. Scouting was encouraged, and that's just where they encouraged people to go out to the site where they were going to be during the eclipse before the eclipse happened, so they can look for some of the animals. And th in this study, they did include plants to see if plants reacted to the eclipse. They could look for some of those things that they were going to want to observe during the eclipse early and scout them out. They recorded observations 30 minutes before, during the eclipse, and then 30 minutes following the eclipse, and uploaded their photos to iNaturalist. So this is really cool, because now it's not just uh, stories or anecdotes, we're getting some photo evidence as well. So what was found? There were 645 participants that uploaded over 2,795 observations, which is a lot. So many of the observations documented no change in behavior, which is still interesting, because why, why not? And then some of the observations were inconclusive, either because they did not uh, follow the instructions, or some of the evidence were things that you cannot capture in a picture alone. So you, a lot of the, um, actually one third of the observations included that they heard frogs that usually come out at night during the daytime while the eclipse was happening when the sky got dark. But you can't take a photo of a sound, so it kind of was inconclusive because there wasn't like proof for that. And also um, things like people observed ants moving in a circle, but you can't capture that they're moving in just a photo. It's just a picture of ants. So that's inconclusive. There was a disproportionate amount of data about dogs, because people brought their dogs with them, and so they were observing what their dogs were doing, which is cool. It's good to know. Dogs are reacting to people reacting more than they're reacting to the eclipse, by the way. 
And this was a really cool study, though, because it was the largest consolidation of observation on plants and animals' behavior during an eclipse that had been uh, gathered until now. So for this next eclipse, and the reason I wanted to talk to you all today is because there is um, a citizen science project funded by NASA called the Eclipse Soundscapes Project. And this is also based on the 1932 campaign. I told you it would be important later. So the goal is to collect multi-sensory observations and data that you will then submit to NASA, and they can look through it for common themes and try to determine what animals really do during an eclipse. And you and your friends and family can help. And I'm really excited for this project. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of the different roles that you could potentially have for this project. This one's called Data Collector, and I know that the writing is really, really small. I'm just showing you, so if you go to the web page, you know that you're at the right place, because this is what it looks like. And if you sign up to be a data collector, you will be sent a free device called an audio moth. And this is a sound recording device, a high quality sound recording device. And so you put it outside um, two days before the eclipse, and then you retrieve it two days following the eclipse, and it's recording sounds the whole time. And that way, um, after you submit it back to NASA, they can go through it and look for things like, do they hear those frogs coming out when the eclipse is happening? Do they hear other nighttime animals like owls? Or do they hear birds' uh, vocalizations? And they'll be able to study that after the eclipse has occurred so they won't be distracted by the eclipse happening while they're analyzing the data. And this is a really cool uh, opportunity because if you live in the path of totality, so between those two red lines on that picture of Ohio that I showed you earlier, you can apply to have one of these sent to you for free because they want to gather data on what happens during a total solar eclipse. Another one of the roles that you can sign up for is called the observer role. And this is just a picture of what you would see on the website. But you do a little training that takes about 15 to 30 minutes where they kind of prime you on the types of things that you'll be looking for, like uh, what animals do you see, what are you hearing, that sort of thing. And you'll take observations uh, 10 minutes before, during, and 10 minutes after the eclipse. And then you will submit this uh, data back to NASA. And they'll go through it and look for some common themes. And this is a good way to kind of be mindful of what's going on during the eclipse and really be present and also to help contribute to what we currently know about uh, animals and about the world that we live in. And you never know. You might find something that surprises you. So this is what the website looks like. It's called eclipsesoundscapes.org. And I'm just really excited about this project. And also, if you complete any of the different uh, tasks you can do, like the observing or the audio recording, they will send you a certificate for helping them contribute to this. So thank you all so much for having me. Don't forget to wear your eclipse glasses. Don't look directly at the sun. Your pets don't need eclipse glasses like this dog. <laughs> They're a lot less likely to look at the sky. So I hope you all have a great time during the eclipse. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Drew, we, we can, can replicate, replicate this. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry, you're like in the dark from my perspective, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, to apply for the audio moth recording device, it is January 31st. So it's, it seems like it's far away, but it's only a couple of weeks away now to apply for that recording device. And I think it's going to be really fun. And you're all eligible to get one for free, so you should do it. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Ooh, this is a good question. They're selling them? Um, all different places I have seen them. So I think... Oh, nice. Oh, okay. In case you didn't hear, the Lima Astronomical Society is a good place to get it. <laughs> and the public library as well. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, I believe so. I searched our um, I searched our zip code on eight oh five. But yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it should be correct. Yes, the time that it is here. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. No problem. Let's see if I can find the website where I got it from. I got it from the Total Solar Eclipse 2024 Ohio uh, website, so that second one on the screen. It has a lot of really good information about when and where. And they have them by state as well, so if you're going to be out of town or in another state, it has what to expect in each state during the eclipse. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. <laughs>on February 15th, we'll be back in this theater with one of NASA's senior aerospace engineers. Among other things, Craig Williams will explain the physics and geometry of the eclipse and some safe watching sources of information. The final um, eclipse science series events will occur on March 21st in Science 100. Meteorologist Dustin Norman from the National Weather Service will talk about how an eclipse changes the world around us, however briefly, including the weather. He will also dive into some of the other unusual weather phenomena that happen in the Midwest. So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Information can be found on the flyers in the lobby, um, which I believe there are also cookies, and we'll have some delightful conversation. Have a great night. <laughs>